We are three fourths of the way through our code connection sessions. I don't know what's going to happen in 2023. We'll have to come up with a replacement for code connection sessions. We all look forward to these each month and I'm really excited tonight because we're going to go over some of the character development plans that the team have been working on. Um, and I want to just give everyone a quick overview of our timeline and expectations for the next several months. Many of you that are on here this evening join us regularly on our Code Connection sessions, and we're glad you're here. Um, just in case you don't know, I'm Shannon Laverin. I'm the Assistant City Manager. And with me this evening, I have Larry Weston, Thomas Eddington, and Matt Ingalls from our Code Consulting team. And they are the ones that will be making the presentation this evening and have been writing our new land development code, or what we are referring to as the Greenville Development Code. We also have several members of our planning staff present this evening, including Mary Douglas Hirsch, uh, Michael Frickson, Chris Kurzak, and Jordan Harris, as well as MJ Simpson from our communications team and Mike Blizzard from our IT team. So thank you all for being here this evening and giving us your time. We really appreciate it. Before I turn it over, I just want to go through a couple of things. First, the timeline still remains that we are anticipating having a draft code ready to release at the beginning of December. December 1 is when we are anticipating having the draft code ready for release. And we will be making sure that each of you all know about that so you can help us spread the word once that draft code is released. And then we will spend time in December and January being out in the community, going through the draft code, um, having open houses for those that are interested and want to know more and learn more. And then we'll probably try to start through the approval process in February. So just so everyone has kind of that timeline, that is what we are aiming for. Um, and as of now, we are still on target for December 1 release date. So I would say um, a great way to start the holidays <laughs> if you think zoning is fun, because we think zoning is fun. And so we're really excited that we're getting that close to having everything ready for release. Um, tonight, we're going to go through our character plans. And I will be monitoring the question and answer section of the um, presentation. We really want to stay stick to the character plans tonight um, that were um, part of what we came out of Greenville 2040 and helping to shape the code for the entire community. If you have questions or comments related to the character plans, please place them in the chat or in the question and answer, and we will attempt to get to them at the end if we have time. If you have specific questions related to the code process itself, the adoption process, or anything related to a specific project, if you will email planning at greenvillesc.gov, that's planning at greenvillesc.gov, we'll make sure to get back to you on that. We want to keep everything focused tonight to our character area plans. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Larry, Thomas, and Matt to take us through our presentation. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Hi, Shannon. Thanks. Um, so again, uh, thanks for joining us. You guys have Many of you have been hanging with us for about, what is it, nine, eight, nine months now. So thank you for that. As Shannon noted, we're going to go through kind of, uh, we're going to go through some of the components that we have incorporated into the character development plans. But just as a reminder, we'll walk through just a couple of slides. How did we get here? Remember, uh, the, development the development code is a direct result of the GVL 2040 recommendation. That was uh, the comprehensive plan was approved last year in February. And so pretty shortly after that, we started the development code process. You can go to the next slide. Um, as a part of that comprehensive plan, you'll remember that we had a series of core values and planning principles. We just like to put these up here, take a glance at them. Um, I, won't, I won't read through them, but these continue to be the framework for not just the GVL 2040 comprehensive plan, but also for the development code moving forward. And so uh, as we write this code, we continue to harken back to these uh, values and principles in our rewrite of the development code. You can move to the next slide. Um, we want to remind everybody, I think we discussed it a little bit at last month's code, uh, code session, uh, code connection session. And that was that as we look at districts and uses, as, in, as we look at the new development code, um, to accommodate growth, uh, we know that this code will be significantly different than the existing code. This will have much more of an urban, uh, an urban characteristic to it in terms of setbacks, design, heights, densities, and the nodes and the corridors, et cetera. So as we've been working through these character development plans, that's been at the forefront of our mind. 
Next slide. You'll remember that we have the five character areas, Buncombe Stone, the pink in the north there, uh, North Lawrence, kind of the middle in the blue there, the corridor. We've got McAllister Square, just to the uh, south of, of course, uh, Lawrence Road Corridor. To the left, to the west, we've got Greater Sullivan, a neighborhood. And to the very far south, we've got the Augusta Gateway District. So we'll kind of walk through the various components that we have incorporated into the character development plans to this point. Remembering each of these districts kind of has a, a unique characteristic to it, whether it's a neighborhood, a corridor, or a growth node, um, they have a unique character. Those will help frame the other uh, similar neighborhoods and or districts or corridors throughout the community. If you go to the next slide, um, I think this is just kind of a uh, slide that indicates the five areas again, and these are, uh, these kind of show the uh, outline, the boundary for each of these areas, you know, each of these areas probably ranged in size from about 100 to about uh, about 200 acres in size. I think Augusta Gateway is the largest one, but you kind of get a sense of the building fabric here. So as we walk through these tonight, you can go to the next slide. Rather than walk you through all of the components of each of these character development plans. Many of the components are somewhat similar. Many are uniquely tailored to that particular neighborhood district or corridor. But one thing that we did uh, we did do in each of the character plans is keep the content to keep the, the, the flow, the information similar. So each one of these kind of has uh, four parts. Part one is really GVL 2040 and how it framed and set the tone for these character development plan areas. Part two is what is the vision for each of these districts, neighborhoods, or corridors. Part three is uh, a focus on the detail. This is really where we get into the recommendations for taking to take planning components to the development code. So taking planning vision, taking planning ideas, and uh, ensuring that it gets put into a regulatory framework used as a tool. And then part four is, um, what does the district or neighborhood corridor look like today versus in 2040 as we look at new zoning for that area? If you go to the next one, each of these, uh, each of these planning areas uh, had a number of prior planning efforts that really kind of set the tone or the framework for them. For example, on the left side, we had the Augusta Gateway District. That in Corp, that, that there's been a number of uh, plans that have been done down in that area, whether it was the, the more recent 2021 uh, corridor study that was uh, that is being led by the county. That one is still underway. We're collaborating with the county uh, regarding that work. That is with regard to uh, kind of the gateway into the city of Greenville and kind of the gateway into the county to the aviation and tech center. And uh, that plan is very informative in uh, this plan as well. We've got the um, street, the Augusta Street uh, diet that is um, well underway. That planning work has been incorporated into this document, as well as the 2004 Pleasantburg Drive Corridor Master Plan. That was a master plan that uh, kind of focused on the extent of uh, Pleasantburg from really McAllister Square down to the Augusta Gateway District. And so. All of those planning efforts have helped inform the character development plan that we're working through now. Um, you can see McAllister Square. They also uh, were, uh, there was some planning work that was uh, incorporated uh, for that area back in uh, the Pleasantburg Drive plan. Uh, North Lawrence had a, uh, the Swamp Rabbit Trail extension framed a lot of our uh, thinking for that area. You've got Buncombe Stone Gateway District. Uh, some of the Pete Hollis uh, gateway work uh, back in, I think that was in 06, and then in 2011, the Stone Avenue Master Plan. We read through those plans, incorporated much of that work into this plan. You know, it's interesting that a lot of that planning work has been implemented, and some of it hasn't been implemented for some of these planning areas, and much of that has to do with not necessarily having the right code in place. And so us looking back to that planning work uh, helps us really frame how the new code should read to accommodate some of the really good planning efforts that were incorporated in there. 
And then finally, the greater Sullivan uh, area had some planning work done uh, by uh, Clemson University and included an inventory, et cetera, of some of the assets in that area. That, that, that work made its way into the new document as well. Tonight, we can't go through all of these plans. So what we thought we would do is walk through McAllister Square. I think that that one is uh, an area that most people are pretty familiar with. And so it's also pretty representative of an area that could have mixed use opportunities, both commercial and residential. So I'll turn it over to Matt to kind of set the framework for that. And we'll walk through some of the components for McAllister Square. Matt will note that some of many of these components are similar for all of the districts, but there are some unique characteristics that made their uh, way into each of the other plans. But we'll walk through McAllister Square as an example for tonight. Great. Thanks, Thomas. <clears throat> as we, uh, as Thomas mentioned, each of these plans, um, although unique, have some similar characteristics. And what we wanted to do is to make sure that uh, not only do they represent each of the areas, but they're useful for us in terms of informing uh, the, the new development code. And then also that they're user friendly. So when you pick one up, you can understand and be able to digest it uh, consistently throughout all five. So you'll see some of this framework that we're going to go over here in the next few slides is uh, very similar, uh, no matter whether you pick up the Augusta uh, Gateway Project uh, plan or whether you pick up uh, the main stone plan or the Lawrence Road or McAllister plan, you'll see uh, a kind of a similar organization. And it starts with these key elements um, for the development framework. So when we were out uh, meeting with uh, the public through the open house process back in, I believe, April, we also had uh, some, some meetings with, with local uh, committees that were representative of each of the areas. We heard a lot of different things. Um, that fell in a bunch of different categories. So key issues, key opportunities, uh, assets, some preliminary recommendations, uh, a variety of things. And so what we wanted to do is organize those into some categories. And what we found is they fell within uh, these five categories. So we have form, which really uh, deals with building height and massing and those types of things. Uh, that's number one there. Number two is housing in the neighborhoods. Uh, number three is parking, and that deals with both on-site parking as well as uh, uh, off-site parking. And then uh, the public realm, which is that area uh, that is within the right-of-ways or public uh, plazas and parks and things like that. And then uh, also connectivity and mobility, which could be sidewalks and trails and connections to the Swamp Rabbit Trail and things like that. As you'll see in this one, um, you'll see that number two is uh, kind of nested under number four and it's hollow. Uh, it doesn't have the same uh, red uh, rose color as the other four. And that's because the housing and neighborhood is not as relevant to McAllister Square as it is relevant to say uh, the, the greater Sullivan area. So that just means that we didn't spend a lot of time on the housing and neighborhood piece of it because the way that this project area was delineated, it didn't really include uh, any of the Gower neighborhood or the Nicoltown neighborhood, but we all know that it sits right in between and certainly the context and the transition to those neighborhoods is very, very important. Next slide, please. Another organizing uh, kind of framework uh, deals with urbanism and you'll see this also in all five of the plans. And it's this notion that great cities are made of great streets, blocks and buildings. This is kind of a fundamental aspect of just good urbanism. And so, uh, next slide, please. When we think about our streets, uh, streets are a very, very important component uh, in terms of how a place functions and feels. In fact, when you add up all of the acreage that's associated with our streets, and that's mainly within our right-of-ways, it almost always outweighs any other public space uh, within uh, a city. So more than parks and recreation and all of those other spaces. So how we design those streets, how we organize them is really, really important. And it's especially important uh, in creating good urbanism. So when we think about our streets moving forward, those are important components. So how they relate to uh, you know, walking and how they accommodate walking and biking and driving and transit. Uh, and then also the interface between what happens in the public realm along the street, and then what happens in the private realm. That relationship is also very, very important in an urban environment. Next slide, please. 
So once you get a good street layout, streets kind of form blocks and those blocks typically, especially you can see that in downtown uh, Greenville and also in some of our you know, neighborhoods throughout Greenville, that you have this grid system that the street creates and that it creates very walkable blocks. And those blocks sometimes are anywhere between 300 and 600 feet. And then you have a decision that you can turn right or left or you can continue to go straight. So those blocks contribute to just good walkability and urbanism, but then they also create a good organization for land and the development of land. Next slide, please. So then the last piece of this is, and it's really the smallest increment of urbanism, uh, is how those buildings sit within those blocks and then how those buildings relate to the streets. So again, great cities are made of great streets, blocks, and buildings, and it doesn't always have to be a perfect grid, but some sort of modified grid or some organizing element is an important aspect of creating urbanism. And as Thomas pointed out, this new code is going to be more urban than the old code. As we reflect back on GVL 2040, it was very clear that the community wanted to continue to grow and make, uh, you know, uh, uh, Greenville continue to be a, a thriving city. Uh, and an attractive place to live and and raise a family and work and all of those things. Uh, so making sure that we accommodate that growth is important. And so to do that, it's going to have to happen in a more urban way. And this code uh, is important aspect of creating that further urbanism down the road. Next slide, please. So as Thomas mentioned, we're going to go through uh, some of this McAllister Square. Um, uh, some of the key recommendations, and then this will give you a good flavor of how the uh, what types of recommendations are in these plans, how they're organized, and that way you can go to the other ones and be able to read them uh, when they're actually uh, uh, released um, in the early part of uh, October. So let's talk about uh, some key recommendations from McAllister Square regarding form. Next slide, please. So as, as I mentioned, those streets and creating blocks uh, and, and kind of that legible urban kind of fabric. That first one is connect compact multimodal streets that connect with each other and surrounding neighborhoods. So right now, especially uh, where the McAllister Square Mall area is, you don't really have uh, a street network there. It's primarily just one big parcel. But as that area begins to redevelop, is there an opportunity to create a more legible uh, street and block and building format? And maybe a combination of what's there now and then maybe some uh, changes as we move forward. And so creating those, uh, you know, that street network is important. And then also developing the walkable blocks that frame public space uh, throughout the McAllister Square area. Again, taking on a more urban kind of feel uh, and function. And then we're going to show you some images here in a minute, just some renderings that's going to be able to illustrate that and you'll be able to see that a little bit uh, better. Next slide, please. So also part of the form are the buildings and that height uh, and massing relationship. And you can see uh, in these graphics here um, to require buildings to integrate with the public realm and to respect the local context and height and massing. So as we kind of heard loud and clear from community members that attended uh, the open house back in uh, in April, um, we showed a, a bunch of different um, kind of building heights and and people were able to to kind of select the ones they liked the most and what's what what is realistic and what's not and what they would like to see and what they wouldn't like to see. So the lowest building heights in these area range about two stories and they might be uh, kind of tucked back away from uh, Pleasantburg Drive a little bit. And then you'll see that there, there's an additional story there, the number three, that's uh, highlighted in red. That's also a bonus story. So one of the things we talked about at those open houses is whether or not people would be open to the idea of maybe going a little bit taller and giving a little bit more height and density. But to be able to do that, uh, a developer would have to also make sure that those additional units that are created by that additional height would be affordable. And then also there would be a, a kind of a component for open space. So we haven't entirely figured exactly what those out are yet, but we know that people are supportive of having some sort of base height system with a bonus uh, associated with it. And so then if you look at the bottom uh, graphic there, the bottom cross section, that's where the highest uh, building heights might take place. And so there would be a, a five stories uh, as a base 
height and then additional two stories that may or may not step back after that fifth story. And you can see that step back there that makes it feel not quite as tall along the street. But then it would also provide that bonus for those that want to take advantage of it and provide uh, affordable housing as well as contribute to uh, open space and green space. So these uh, these bonus systems you'll you'll see uh, in all five of the plans, and they are in the, in the form of additional height um, for contributing to affordable units as well as open space. The next category uh, of those five is parking. And parking is always one of those things that um, you know it's uh, it's necessary to make things happen, but it also can can eat up a lot of valuable land, and it can also make a place feel not quite as walkable. So you'll probably can think of places along some key corridors, or maybe even a McAllister Square area now that has a lot of front yard parking, and it's difficult to make a a place that's very walkable when you have just. Um, you know, parking lots that front the, the sidewalk in the street. And then also you have to cross all of that parking to be able to get to the building fronts. So one of the key components in all of this, and again, this is going back to urbanism, is to require that parking be in the rear or the side yard and never on a corner. And so that way we create the building that's moved a little bit closer to the street and has a relationship to the street and the sidewalk and the pedestrian realm. So that way you can easily get uh, walk down the street and be able to walk into buildings, but then if also if you wanted to drive, you could park to the side or in the rear and also enter from that direction as well. Next slide, please. Um, also utilizing structured parking when possible. Uh, certainly structured parking is ideal because it eats up a lot less land and it's, you know, it's just easier to, uh, to, to kind of manage rather than large parking lots, but structured parking is expensive. So it's certainly contingent on whether the, 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 the math can work from a development standpoint. So we're certainly sensitive to that, but also recognizing that utilize structured parking when possible. And then also require parking lots to include pedestrian ways and tree islands. So when you do have those big parking lots that are tucked to the to the side or behind buildings, that you do have pedestrian ways that get people safely from parking their cars to the sidewalk system and to buildings along the street, and then also making sure that they're well landscaped and they're not dominated by uh, just uh, the asphalt that's out there. Next slide. And then also integrating the amount of on street parking. And I think this is especially important uh, in the redevelopment, uh, long term redevelopment of McAllister Square, because you have, there could be this opportunity to create internal streets that, um, that could be designed in a way that you have on street parking. And that's a great way to accommodate additional parking. And maybe you don't have to have as much on off street parking. And it's also very convenient and it's also good for uh, shop front owners that might be along those streets. So uh, increasing the amount of on-street parking uh, when possible. We're certainly not talking about putting on-street parking on Pleasantburg Drive or any of the major corridors, but certainly uh, as new streets are developed or there's side streets that can be, uh, where on-street parking can be accommodated, it's certainly a desirable thing and it's in a way to offset uh, that, that parking requirement. Next slide. Okay, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Thomas to talk us through a couple of the other categories and it's gonna start with uh, public realm. Great, thanks, Matt. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so one of, the, uh, one of the components that we really heard quite a lot about during our public outreach for this was the importance of connecting properties, buildings to the street. And so the public realm is a pretty important piece. Typically zoning codes don't address the public realm as much as they address the private property individual parcels. And so one of the components of the new code will be this attempt to improve the public realm and really ensure that the, uh, that the public realm space is addressed uh, in the same way, very much the same way as the private property. So expanding sidewalk areas and landscape buffers, um, incorporating street trees, that is something that we heard from virtually everybody we touched base with. It's important to note that it's also about how it's designed and how it's uh, regulated in the engineering and design specifications manual, which is also being updated as part of this development code uh, rewrite, um, ensuring that sidewalks where possible are not located right along the curb, for example. That tends to be a very um, unsafe experience for most pedestrians. And so ensuring that there's a landscape buffer, street trees where possible, and then the sidewalk on the inside of that. 
that's a recommendation from this planning, uh, the character development planning effort that will make its way into the new development code. You go to the next one. Next slide. Um, along that line is the uh, recommendation to eliminate um, curb cuts where possible and or limit multiple curb cuts. So you've seen different uh, uh, different developments uh, it could be uh, big box. It could be uh, smaller retail centers that have multiple curb cuts along the street from a pedestrian perspective that creates a significant amount of uh, safety challenges as they have to uh, attempt to cross those access points for private property. So where we can, we would uh, we recommend limiting them where there's opportunities to share curb cuts between businesses. We'll, uh, we'll uh, incorporate that into the code as well. Safety for bike infrastructure right now, bike infrastructure is limited throughout the community outside of the swamp rabbit trail. There are some areas, but it's not nearly extensive enough. And because it's not as extensive, because it's not as common, uh, people who are on those painted lanes tend to feel a little bit less safe. Cars don't necessarily know how to address them and they don't know where their comfort level necessarily is with regard to uh, the vehicles passing by. So increasing the amount of painted lanes, separated lanes, et cetera, will go a long way to uh, enabling bike, uh, bike accessibility throughout the community and giving them a better, uh, a better presence that's more understandable. And then the uh, third one is reintroducing public alleys. Public alleys are not typical in uh, parcels that have buildings set back from the street, but if the building is pulled up to the street, opportunities for parking behind and uh, marginal access, limited access, or public alleys uh, provide an opportunity for not only utilities uh, to be uh, carried underground or overground to a building, but also they provide for um, uh, safety vehicle access, they provide for uh, trash truck access, et cetera. So making sure that those uses are as separated as much as possible from the front and sides of a, of a building where pedestrians and bicycles will be, does increase uh, safety opportunities for those users. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> including a minimum percentage of green space for major developments. The new code will address minimum requirements for parkland or open space, could be passive or active, depending on the size of the site, but ensuring that that gets incorporated into new developments and ensuring that maybe that park space has access to a trail or a pedestrian way or a bike way or a sidewalk, ensuring that that connectivity is incorporated and is required as part of any new uh, site planning uh, will be incorporated into the new code as well. So it may be a pedestrian and bike circulation plan, not unlike access for uh, vehicles to a private site, uh, paying attention to pedestrians and bicycles will be baked into that process as well, moving forward. Next slide. Site and development standards, oh, you can go back one. Site and development standards, uh, to ensure the uh, building setback, say along the Lawrence Road corridor, Lawrence Road and uh, potentially Pleasantburg, uh, ensuring that, again, as Matt noted earlier, the parking lots aren't up front, the buildings are pushed proud of the parking. Uh, if reducing those front setback requirements will go a long way to creating more walkable environments. And then as somebody walks along a building, it's, uh, it's uncomfortable if there is not a significant amount of window space, glazing, transparency, ensuring a minimum requirement for building faces that are up against the uh, streets or the public rights of way. Bake that into the code as well. Next one. Connectivity and mobility. You can go to the next slide. One of the tenets of the comprehensive plan was uh, improving transit and mobility options. Much of that deals with uh, public transit, working and partnering uh, with GreenLink, uh, ensuring better pedestrian connectivity and bike connectivity. The slide that you see in front of you now is a comparison of existing conditions, uh, 2020 conditions, uh, uh, to uh, compared to the 2000 conditions. So as you can see, uh, driving alone has actually increased over the course of the past 20 years in the city of Greenville. You can see that carpooling has actually decreased. Public transit, relatively static. Walking decreased a little bit. Biking 
relatively stable, slightly increasing, and certainly working at homes uh, has increased. So again, this is a comparison from 2000 to 2020. So the 2020 condition, certainly COVID started to change the way uh, that many people work and more people can work at home. Uh, we'll likely see that number increase, but really our focus is reducing the number of folks that drive alone, increasing those that carpool and encouraging bike and um, pedestrian activity. So given that the numbers have been going in the wrong direction, part of that is probably that some of our connection points for pedestrians and bicycles aren't necessarily that complete, aren't necessarily that safe. Maybe they're not that attractive. And so to go to the next slide, we wanted to make sure that we incorporated in the new plan opportunities to connect to, say, the Swamp Rabbit Trail. And kind of think of the Swamp Rabbit Trail as something a little bit more than maybe just a recreational trail, but start to think of it as a uh, commuter trail. In this particular uh, example, again, we're talking about McAllister Square. We, we you know, we, we really went through some detailed analysis to see where those connection points could be. The city is completing the Swamp Rabbit Trail extension on the north side of Lawrence. Is there a way to start to connect McAllister Square up to that extension? And so looking at opportunities for maybe expanding the tunnel that is Pleasantburg Drive that goes under uh, Lawrence Avenue and allowing for a separated bike pedestrian path would start to get people from McAllister Square uh, up to the Swamp Rabbit Trail and create open up a number of opportunities for them to go north and into the downtown and or south into the Verde area. Looking to the south, opportunities to connect McAllister Square down near the existing Swamp Rabbit Trail that runs south toward the park area. And so I, I won't go through the details here, but just outlining some areas where we could follow power line easements, um, create a separated trail, take uh, advantage of uh, some areas that might be a little bit tight, um, maybe uh, painting some bike paths along the road where we don't have separated trail access. Again, all in an effort to make sure that the ease of walking, the ease of cycling uh, is on par with that of the vehicle, the car. Um, so uh, each of the development plans, the character development plans that we worked through uh, offers recommendations to connect to the Swamp Rabbit Trail and other trails throughout the community. So uh, satisfying the need or the recommendation in GVL 2040 to increase transit opportunities other than the car, the vehicle. Go to the next slide. This is a slide that's, that, that starts to illustrate what could be envisioned for say Pleasantburg Drive. Pleasantburg Drive uh, carries about the same number of cars, about 25, 26,000 vehicles per day, as does, say, Lawrence, as does, say, Wade Hampton. They all run about the same numbers. Pleasantburg Drive gets uh, much busier up near the interstate and up near Wade Hampton. But in this area, it's about 25, 26,000, pretty typical of what are uh, mostly five lane roads. Two in one direction, two lanes in the other direction, and a center turn lane. Again, Wade Hampton, Lawrence, et cetera. But Pleasantburg is actually seven lanes. And so, is there an opportunity to start to look at um, a road diet that takes back some of that space for, say, a cycle track, a protected, uh, separated area for uh, that would be utilized by uh, pedestrians and bicyclists? So we also know this is a tough sell with uh, DOT, South Carolina DOT, but it starts to offer a plan and a vision to give the city an opportunity to negotiate and aim for something that offers not just vehicle access on some of our major rights of way, but better pedestrian and cycling access. You can go to the next slide. Um, and along that line, the importance of continuing to partner with GreenLink. Certainly GreenLink is a department of incorporated within the city, but that partnership between planning, building, engineering, transit, Green Link in this case, is going to be so important moving forward. And where we can begin to improve or um, integrate uh, 
these transit stops into the buildings or into maybe kind of the park areas, giving them uh, space off of the right of way. So it's easy for, uh, say, a bus to pull over and traffic to continue uh, moving down the, uh, the rights of way. That will be important moving forward. Certainly, McAllister Square is an area, you know, McAllister Square is about 165 acres, I think. The downtown core is about 167 acres. So McAllister Square has the opportunity to really kind of shape and reinvent what happens in this area along uh, the intersection of Pleasantburg and Lawrence Road. It's a large area, so transit could play a role here because it's a relatively concentrated area and uh, could see significant amounts of redevelopment. So transit's a big part of that. I think the last few slides we have for McAllister Square are a comparison of you know what the existing conditions are today and what they could be in say 20 40 10 20 30 years uh down the road if we started to see redevelopment and um opportunity redevelopment and development opportunities as a result of new zoning you can go to the next slide and in this slide um you can see that Right now, oh, I said it was 165 acres, it's 156. So uh, a little bit of dyslexia there. Um, but you can see the population is virtually non existent right now in the McAllister Square area. But if we start to look at this area as mixed use uh, zoning that was fully built out, this is an area that could realize uh, a population of about 6,000 people. And right below that, you can see uh, that would be over 3,000 dwelling units. Again, most of these would be more urban, more multifamily in terms of makeup, but it's a significant opportunity to house people, the new population that's moving into the community, and also provide affordable housing, um, given some economies of scale and density. And then finally, you can see that right now, McAllister Square, not much of a, uh, a population, a residential center, but certainly with over 4,000 employees, it's a significant commercial center. Uh, that could increase as well based on um, you know, some of our scenario planning that was uh, mixed use uh, village center in nature. So as we look forward to um, reason, as we look forward to the benefits of rezoning this area, there's also the opportunity to capture a significant amount of growth that will be uh, heading into Greenville as the business community continues to move forward. I think our last couple of slides, unless we want to move into different areas, are going to be some potential renderings that illustrate what this area could look like. And I'll turn this over to uh, Matt to kind of walk you through these last couple of images. Great, thanks, Thomas. As I mentioned earlier, we do have a couple of just uh, concept illustrations. Now, these are meant to be just um, you know concepts and ideas to illustrate some of the concepts that we've been talking about and part of the development framework that we've been talking about throughout. Uh, the presentation here from McAllister Square. As you'll see here, this is looking uh, north uh, towards uh, Lawrence Road, and you see that right there in the, the kind of the left side there, right at the edge where you see all the street trees, that is uh, Pleasantburg Drive. So you'll see in this graphic, um, now one little caveat here is that, you know, we took the liberty of, of, cause we wanted to make sure that we included green space and open space. Cause that's certainly a part, important part of GBL 2040 and something that we wanna make sure that we move the needle on uh, when we think about the new development code. So we took the opportunity to say, you know what, if, we, if, if Pleasantburg Drive doesn't get downsized and it maintains uh, seven lanes uh, with heavy traffic, then how can we begin to create a little bit of a buffer between that street and then also some public space to transition to what is more urban development. And so you'll see there's a kind of a linear park along Pleasantburg Drive and it kind of connects south into the existing trail system that you have uh, just south of, of the mall. And then this would be, you know, a combination of things. It could be uh, parks and trails, obviously, throughout this area. Uh, a lot of the trees that are some of the really beautiful mature trees that are part of uh, the mall parking lots right now, um, maybe there's an opportunity to preserve some of those and make those uh, part of uh, the, the, new, the new fabric that makes it feel um, kind of um, seasoned and, and, and like it's been around a little while. And then we transition to, into a combination of anywhere from three up to what could be uh, five and seven story buildings in the center uh, of that area. And then as you move towards Landwood uh, to the right side of that graphic, 
those buildings would step down and transition and what we refer to as both physical and land use transition to the residential character that you have as you move towards uh, the Gower neighborhood. So this is just a, a kind of a concept uh, just to begin to illustrate what we're talking about when we think about uh, more of a grid internal street pattern and we talk about recognizable blocks and buildings that relate to those, uh, those blocks and those streets. Next slide, please. So this is a, a, a street level uh, perspective that's looking north right uh, along that linear park that I mentioned uh, that's just inside is that transition from Pleasantburg Drive to the more urban uh, development. You can kind of see that there's a, a typical uh, urban street with on-street parking, generous sidewalks. Uh, in this case, there's actually shop front um, buildings there on the first floor. There's street trees and it begins to take on a much more urban feel. Uh, and again, bring in some of those concepts that we talked about uh, er on earlier slides and illustrating them uh, in some of these, uh, again, just concept illustrations. Does it mean it's gonna happen this way? Does it mean that um, it's gonna be exactly this way? But certainly uh, moving the, the development code in a more urban way that, that actually allows this type of development to happen and actually encourages it. Next slide. And then this is a, an image that's looking north on, on Landwood. And you can see on the right side of that graphic, there are the, the one and a half story um, uh, ranch houses and bungalows that are out there existing. And then on the left side, and this is where I was talking about that land use transition uh, down to a two uh, story or two and a half story um, residential development that, that could be on that other side that begins to have a relationship and provide a transition from the residential area on one side residential across the other side, and then on the back side of those buildings to your left, you would ramp back up into McAllister Square where you have some taller buildings and that urban street network uh, that's in there. So I think um, with that, I think we're at a really good point where we can uh, answer questions. We, I know we, we, uh, we took a little bit longer than probably what uh, we were anticipating, but hopefully this gives you a really good overview of what the plans are about, some of the recommendations uh, that are in there, how they're actually organized. And so that way when they come out in the first part of October and you pick one up, it doesn't matter which one you pick up, they'll all be organized the same way. And then you can see some of those uh, recommendations and concepts that we're talking about in each one of those. And then uh, later on, you should be able to make that link into the new development code and be able to see some of these uh, provisions that uh, are gonna try to make some of this stuff happen. So. With that, Santa. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt and Thomas and Larry. We really appreciate this. So I have a few questions, if you don't mind, that um, I'm going to use to get us started on the conversation. And Matt, something that you've really been talking about lately with staff, and I think it would be beneficial to have a conversation tonight, and that is, can you talk a little bit more about the importance of the street classifications as it relates to not only these plans, but what we're working on in the zoning code and how important that is to the long-term urbanization of just the community and what it calls for in Greenville 2040? Yeah, absolutely, Shannon. And I know that that's something that we, we have been talking a lot about lately, just the importance of how Urbanism is not just um, pulling the buildings up to the street and tucking parking back behind uh, uh, the buildings or making multi-story buildings or just mixed use. It's kind of, it's a combination of things working together that creates a, a good urban environment. And if you think about downtown and how the streets of downtown integrate really well with the public ground. So you can walk down Main Street, you can walk into a building, you can park along the street, you can find public parking, uh, whether it be in a garage or whether it be tucked behind buildings, um, but how those streets are actually designed and how they accommodate all modes of travel. And then also that interface, and you'll hear me say this probably a bunch more times over the next several months, is that interface between the public and the private realm is so important in the urban environment. And so when you think of a place like Lawrence Road, you can imagine if you, right now, I think most of Lawrence Road, especially North Lawrence Road, uh, has the sidewalk right on the curb. You're looking at two lanes in each direction, uh, maybe sometimes one lane in each direction with center turn lane, but then you have that sidewalk right on the road, uh, right on the curb, no street trees. Even if you move the buildings closer to the street, 
it's not going to feel comfortable as a pedestrian. It's not going to feel urban. So that's why we need to think about how these streets begin to transform over time, still accommodate the traffic that's needed to be accommodated, but also be able to better accommodate pedestrians and not just building a sidewalk because there's a sidewalk there, but walkability is more than just a sidewalk. It's how a place feels and how a place functions. And what we want to do is create all of those things kind of working together with these, the future of streets. So um, I think it's a good time to start talking about streets and how looking at the street system within Greenville and then put them in what types of streets they are. There are gonna be some streets that are really geared more towards moving traffic. Then there are gonna be other streets that are really more pedestrian oriented streets. Certainly you can drive on them, you can bike on them, but also there, you really wanna make sure you accommodate the pedestrians. So all streets aren't created equal. And so what we wanted to start doing is thinking about what different street types and then what are characteristics and design components that should be part of each one of those street types. So that's something we're gearing up now and we're going to be talking more and more about it over the next month or two. Well, and I think that's really important and not to put you on the spot, <laughs> but yeah. um, one of the things that I think here in the city that we really focus on a lot, and it's a word that I don't think we use enough in our vocabulary, um, just when we're talking in general about the success of the urbanization of downtown as the public realm. Yes. And I think that one of the things that makes um, downtown Greenville special is that, yes, there, there's buildings that people, you know, everyone's got their opinions on whether they like a building architecture or not. But I think what really makes our downtown special um, is how we have treated the public realm. Um, I think that actually contributes to the success of the space more so than the actual building architecture. And so I think we've done a good job of addressing the public realm in the downtown, but maybe not so much on other parts of the community. And is that something we can expect to see in the code is how to address the public realm, especially along our corridors? Absolutely. As I mentioned, um, when we think of the most people, when they think of the public realm, they just think of the right of way or the street itself. But I think what we need, and, and this is where you, you're absolutely right, in downtown, you've, you've, Greenville has done a really good job of expanding that idea of the public realm to include that front um, part of the building and how it interfaces with the public realm. And so when that's one of the things that I think you're going to see in the new development code that we've been talking a lot about, it's not really about whether the building has, you know, a cornice or it doesn't, or it has this type of uh, material on the front versus not. That's, that can be important, but what's really critical to creating really good urban places, and you could think about this, you know, everybody that's out there in all your travels, even outside of Greenville, think about the places you go. It's a lot of just principle based stuff. Having that transparency on the first floor and how that feels as you walk down the street as a pedestrian, how that building height relates to the street width. And so if you're on a really narrow street in a really tall building, that feels different than if you're on a really wide street in a really wide sidewalk with a really tall building. So making sure that we get those proportions right, that we make sure that we get that first transparency right, make sure that we get a rhythm on the street of buildings so you don't have, you don't walk, you know, and then you, there's a building on the street and then there's buildings that are set way back with front yard parking and things like that. All of that, inter, that impacts the public realm. So absolutely, I think that as, as development continues to occur and growth continues to occur in Greenville, you can get that outside of downtown. And it can become more pedestrian friendly and it can become more uh, urban feeling and the public realm can be really attractive and a great place to be. Thank you. And now I'm going to go into another um, question that I have that you mentioned in your presentation today, and I think it continues to to be on the minds of many, <laughs> at least some of us planning nerds, and that is parking. You know, oh. parking is such a, um, can be a very controversial t topic and subject within planning because I think we all recognize that how we um, we're trying to move from a very auto centric, um, you know, community to maybe a little less auto centric, especially in the future. And of course, this is a plan for 2040 and we expect that there's going to be some changes in technology that are going to change the way that 
we commute possibly by 2040. Um, and so talk to us a little bit about how you plan to treat parking with both these plans and with the new zoning code, because I continue to hear people have concerns about parking. We don't have enough parking in certain cases, or we don't, we don't require enough parking in certain cases. In other cases, we're requiring too much parking, which then ends up being a develop, I mean, we get a development standard that we don't like because we're forcing people to build taller to accommodate more parking and parking garages, or we're forcing more land to be taken up with on with surface parking lots. Talk to me about how you all think we need to be addressing parking both in these plans and in the new code. Sure. Take it up. Yeah. So I'll start and then Thomas can, can jump in. So parking is one of those things that, um, as you know, as planners, and actually, even if you're a resident, probably listen to this. Parking is always one of those things that um, is is a kind of a necessary evil to a certain extent. It's one of those things that we always have to figure out how to deal with. And to be honest with you, it can make or break uh, a project sometimes. Um, so I think first and foremost, as we become or the city becomes more urban, um, on street parking is something that I think um, that that's important, you know, and, and and the reason why I say that it's not just because it provides space for parking, but it does a couple of things. And I, and I, I, I we do a lot of uh, also work on a lot of neighborhood plans and things like that where people are like, geez, you know what? I'm sick of people speeding down the street, but at the same time, they don't want parking on the street. They don't want their street to feel narrow. But what happens is having wide streets, and when you eliminate parking, that makes it feel wider. Unfortunately people feel more comfortable to drive faster. So sometimes it's not a bad thing to have parking on the street where people have to slow down because they do have people that are opening doors or they do have cars that are offset that they just physically need to, sh to slow down. So I know that sometimes, um, especially in neighborhoods, it can be, um, especially when people start blocking driveways and things like that, totally get that. But in general, uh, on-street parking provides more um, benefit than just a space, a space to park. It creates a buffer as you're a pedestrian walking down the street on the sidewalk, having traffic right along the curb sometimes is a little bit uncomfortable. When you have that parked car there, a row of parked cars, that makes it feel a little bit more comfortable. It's actually a buffer between uh, the sidewalk and uh, the, the traffic that's passing by. When you put uh, on-street parking aside, what we need to do is start thinking about right-sizing uh, parking. What, what's happened, I think, and this is not just Greenville, it's it's all over uh, uh, American cities, is that we've tend to, especially in a more suburban model, like I think Greenville's had outside of downtown, is that we've over-prescribed parking. The parking minimums, that's why we all go by certain places, whether they be plazas and things like that. And are there cars in the parking lot? Absolutely. But then there's all of that asphalt that uh, never really gets parked on unless maybe a few times a year. And that all contributes to stormwater. There's the raindrops fall on that area as well. They end up in our streams, they end up in our pipes, uh, and they contribute to that. So I think the key, Shannon, is trying to find a balance between right sizing parking and not having too little, but not having excessive parking. And there are some cities out there that are starting to go in certain areas, especially when you're talking about mixed use areas, because mixed use areas, you might have one use that has a peak time of uh, Monday through Friday, uh, like a lot of um, you know, office uses and stuff that have parking lot that needs to accommodate Monday through Friday from eight to five or whatever. Well, on the weekend, if you just have that parking sitting there, it's, it's not being utilized. So, but maybe that can be utilized in mixed use concepts where you might have retail or other uses that can that use that parking on the off peak times. So making sure that we consider mixed use and off peak times for parking to kind of right size it. And then also there are communities that are just doing away with minimum parking standards in certain areas and asking and requiring developers to show us that they can actually adequate park, adequately create parking for it. And the caveat there is that people need to understand that a developer is not going to create a project that is not going to be successful without the required parking. So the key is, is again, finding balance there. And I'm not saying that we should eliminate all parking minimums, but I think that it's something that we should at least discuss for certain areas. Whereas we can show, if, if, if somebody can show us, uh, an applicant can show us that, hey, you know what? We can adequately park this with this number of spaces. Um, then, you know, then, then sometimes we need to trust that that's part of their business model and that they can make it happen to make 
make their uh, project successful. I and agree, Matt, and I, I'm just going to add real quick um, that I think that we do have some standards where we're getting we're getting designs of sites and or buildings that we would prefer not to have because they're having to find a way to park. Um, and meet our parking standards, but if our parking standards were more in line with what the developer says they actually need and not what an ordinance says that they're required to do, we might get a better resulting site design and or building design because of that. So, yeah. you know, we do have buildings where we're getting podium parking and height on top of it. And sometimes, you know, are they are they needing that parking to meet their minimums or are they needing that parking to meet our requirements? That's and right. so the, and, and I agree with you. I don't think a lot of developers will under park a development if because they have certain I mean, they have investors and they have certain requirements that they're going to have to meet with their performance, et cetera. So I think that you're right. I will also just let the the um, the audience know that I think that the urban land Institute has done a really good shared parking model. If anybody's interested in that for anyone who's a super planning nerd yes. like me, who actually loves to read about parking. It's great I bedtime was, reading. It <laughs> is great. It is great reading. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Well, we Shannon, have two I questions in the thing. chat. Shannon, oh, go ahead, I just Thomas. One thing to that. I think that it's also important to remember that as we look at revising our parking standards, as we look at right sizing our parking standards, that that's important, that there's an important relationship to trails and bike infrastructure. We kind of talked about it earlier, but they're not independent. If we can reduce some infrastructure for parking and vehicles, we can start to dedicate some of those dollars toward bikes and pedestrians, trails and transit in other uh, to offer kind of an, uh, a, a counterweight to that, op, to the uh, vehicular option. I think that you can start to change the culture. You know, there are some places we noted earlier on in the presentation, it's only at about 0.4.5% of the people um, in Greenville are using uh, bikes to get to work, for example, right? That's relative. That's pretty low actually, right? Places like Boulder, Colorado, not a terribly great climate, especially in winter, right? They're up near 19 and 20 percent of people who are commuting. They do have a university there that adds to that. But even without the university, they're in the teens, they're in the high teens that use that kind of infrastructure to get to work. So offering those opportunities in conjunction with reduction of parking goes a long way as well. And I will say that the, the work that the city and the county are doing on the Swamp Rabbit Trail, I think, will only help to increase those options for Absolutely. bicycling options for work. So we've got a lightning round tonight. We're going to do something new because we have two questions in the chat and we're up on our time. So I'm going to give you 60 seconds for each question. Um, so the first one goes to our parking need, uh, from Sherry. Need robust transit to give folks a mobility option for covering non walkable distances, which I think we've started to come somewhat address. Please address how transit transit and parking requirements work in tandem. So here's your 60 seconds, go. Well, actually, I think you're right in line with where we were with regard to what you don't have to invest in terms of parking, asphalt, podium parking, developers and the city can start to invest those dollars in trails and connectivity with regard to other uh, transit opportunities. And so pretty much in line right there. So thanks for that. And other, I'll just add one quick thing is that when you reduce parking standards in a lot of places, the other modes go up because people ad adapt and they find other ways uh, to get places. So walking, biking in transit. Thank you. And our last question is from Lois. What are you thinking will protect urban residential lots from urban nuisances? Trash collection question mark, entertainment spaces question mark, other nuisance ordinances question mark. I'll let Matt speak to this in detail if he wants, but one of the uh, one of the recommendations, one of the recommendations for each of the uh, character development plan areas that we looked at is uh, better setbacks for uh, rear and side yards for commercial structures that abut that are adjacent to residential development, in ensuring that there's uh, both a landscape component to that and or a fence or a wall requirement that would create that separation so that it's both a visual and uh, a sound attenuation uh, reduction uh, between commercial and residential. Anything? Yeah. No, okay. I think you nailed it. Yeah, we, we wanted to make sure that that was outlined very clearly in the code so that wasn't left to uh, kind of a subjective review. That's defined. Great, perfect. Well, that ends our lightning round for the evening. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and we are right on time, right on one hour for our code connection session for the month of September. Thank you everyone for being here this evening. We really appreciate it. Continue to visit our website where you can, can learn about all of the work we're doing with the Greenville Development Code. And we are very excited to see you all here again. And we will be back in October. I think we're um, October. I think we're around maybe the 12th. I don't have the date in front of me. I'm sure someone does, but it'll be the second Wednesday at 5 p.m. We'll be here for our 10th Code Connection session. Um, is Larry, I, or is there anything else you wanna add before we head out tonight? From our team? Uh, no, no, I think with these guys, it's very hard to anything. They've, uh, ah, they've covered get a it word in. Well. Sorry, Larry. Sorry. No, 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 no. I'm here to back up, but none was needed tonight. How about that? I think they did a great job. All right. Well, we've had a fun day with learning about zoning and plans. And um, I do have a couple more questions that I didn't get to that I wanted to ask tonight. So I'll hold those for the October Code Connection session. And with that, we'll thank you guys for being here and see everyone again next month. Thank you. Sounds good. Bye. Take care.